Here's a little story that finds its way into homilies during Lenten season, but it brings up a very good point. One cold winter evening during Lent, a priest was walking back from the parish hall to his rectory. His parish was not the best of neighborhoods, okay? A man hiding in the shadows didn't recognize him as a priest because the priest had his top coat buttoned all the way up to his chin. But the man came out of the shadows with a gun and demanded that the priest give him his wallet. So when the priest opened up his coat to get his wallet, the gunman saw the priest's Roman collar and began to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. I didn't know you were a priest. I can't steal from a priest. Just, just go on your way. The priest, so very, very much relieved, reached into his coat pocket then and took out a cigar. He said to the man, well, thank you, my good man, for letting me go. Let me give you this cigar. The robber said, I appreciate that, Father, but I can't take it. I gave up smoking for Lent. <laughs> the obvious point here is that here is someone who gave up smoking for Lent but not stealing from people, okay? As we've been going through for the first couple of weeks of Lent, this holy season is not just about giving things up, it's about changing our lives to become better, more holier people. People who are capable of fully following the commandments of God that we heard from our first reading there from Exodus. But for so many of us, we're like that robber in the story. We sometimes don't get things exactly right. And we may try to do things in a holy, religious way, but all the while we're trying to get ahead in this world of ours. And so sometimes we compromise. We blend too much of the world with the ways of God as we find ourselves not really changing, not really becoming the people God has called us to be. So sometimes God has to shake us up, and sometimes shake us up pretty good. In today's gospel, we see one of the most dramatic and, quite frankly, powerful scenes in the entire Bible. For today, we see an angry God. Now, for some people, this gospel, the cleansing of the temple, is totally shocking. As we see our Lord Jesus, who so very often is viewed as kind, merciful, loving, patient. Well, that is Jesus. But here we see him today make a whip out of rope, out of cords, and driving out all the animals supposed to be used for sacrifice, driving out the money changers and the merchants. Jesus is angry here. And don't you guys fall for that preaching that some people like to give on this, on this gospel, who try to water this down because they too are uncomfortable with the sight of an angry God by saying things like, Jesus, he had the whip, but it was only symbolic. He didn't really mean to use it. Really? You know, there are people who have no problem at all with this gospel passage. I myself have never been shocked or startled at this image that St. John gives to us of Jesus driving out all those who are making a mockery of the temple, the house of God. I mean, let's be honest, those people were turning the house of God into a Walmart. And our Lord was just days away from laying down his life on the cross for all of us. What do you expect him to do, just stand there? Jesus really did mean to use the whip. It wasn't symbolic. The problem that we have, though, for so many people, they don't like this notion of an angry God. But anger is just the reaction to something that is not right. If something isn't right, if it's not the way it's supposed to be, the way that God laid out, well, of course we're going to get angry. There's a whole lot of things that are not right with this world. And one of the things that may not be right is how we live our lives. Sometimes for God, sometimes for the world, sometimes just for ourselves. Do you suppose then that God just goes about his business, doesn't express himself in any way? Our Lord Jesus, most especially because he is both God and man, is quite capable of expressing his emotions, including anger, as we see here today. But you have to understand something, okay? Take something to heart here, all right? Jesus is angry, true enough. He's also a little bit violent here. He had the whip, the scourge in his hand. Okay, that's true. But he is not punishing someone to the point of death. Do you guys understand that, right? He's not looking to go out and kill somebody. He's acting out of a burning, consuming love. 
Jesus loves the Father so much. He loves the temple, the place of God's presence so much that if there are those who are not worshiping God properly, who are turning the temple into a den of thieves, then Jesus will act with so much force that the apostles will later on remember Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. And actually in the, in the original language it's more forceful. Zeal for your house will eat me up. You see, for us, we are used to becoming so angry, it's the anger that consumes us. It's the rage and the fury that eats us up. But here, and this is quite the difference, it's the love for things of God, beginning with the Father, and seeing how proper worship of God was not being done that caused our Lord Jesus to act in this manner. This was the example of righteous anger. Because righteous anger is always based on love. Now, keep something in mind, because we're going to see just in a minute here how to apply all this to ourselves. Let's quickly take a look at the extent of what our Lord Jesus did here. The part of the temple area which had all the money changers, those who exchanged pagan coins for Jewish coins, because the Jews didn't want their treasury to become defiled, this part of the temple which had all those animals, the oxen, the sheep, the doves, the pigeons, and so forth, used to be sacrificed. This part of it was enormous, about the size of three football fields, okay? Big, huge. Also, there would have been thousands of people there in Jerusalem because this is about ready to have the Feast of Passover. So all this commotion, all this stuff going on there, okay? So get this straight. Jesus did not just kick out a few animals, just shoo away a couple of birds. He didn't just dismiss a couple of money changers, just flip over a couple of tables. No. He drove out three football fields worth of those, as he said, were making my father's house into a marketplace. Only someone who was God could have done that. And many saints and other commentators over the years have stated, can you imagine the light, the fire in the eyes of our Lord Jesus as he was doing all of this? It must have been an awesome thing to have seen. But then the Jews come up to Jesus after all this commotion and ask him, which is quite frankly, one of the most foolish questions ever asked in the Bible. What sign can you show us for doing this? Now at first, this might look like those people who are making all this money, you know, ripping off the, the pilgrims there with all this kind of uh, business deals they were cutting there. We're simply asking Jesus, how dare you do such a thing? Why? What sign can you show us for doing this? But it's like, wait a minute. What sign? Are you kidding me? You really needed a sign. Jesus just got through driving out dozens upon dozens of money changers and merchants, driving out hundreds, if not thousands, of animals, and you want a sign? The cleansing was the sign. But because those people failed once again, to see Jesus for who he truly was. For only God, only the Messiah, could have done such a thing. Jesus tries one more time to get them to see him as he truly is. So he answers their question with, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, of course, they missed that one too. They thought Jesus was talking about the massive temple of stone right there in front of them. He, of course, was talking about the temple of his body. You know, the whip that Jesus used to drive out everyone and everything would turn out to be nothing compared to the horrible whips that would scourge his body just a few days later. Our Lord's love for the Father drove him to cleanse the temple, but it would cost him. It would cost him his life. But that too was done out of complete love for the Father. So how can we apply all of this to ourselves? Just like the ancient Israelites were always aware, always on guard for false gods sneaking in, either into worship or into their lives, well, the same thing can happen to us. We can take what should be given to God, our love, our time, our energy, our resources, our worship, and give those things to something else, something other than God. And so we too may find ourselves in need to have the cleansing of our temple, 
Because remember what St. Paul said, that the body of each Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now by this, he means that for those of us who are baptized, we are a place where the one true God is honored and worshiped. That's why you guys got to take care of yourselves, man. But think then that Jesus has come not only to cleanse the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple of your body, your lives. The Lord Jesus comes into your life expecting to find a place that's ordered to the worship of the one true God. But so often he comes and he finds a marketplace. See, God will go to the depths of our hearts to examine them. It's one of the great things of the Lenten season, allow God to do that, okay? But what does this mean? It means that the light of the Holy Spirit may find in our hearts that things other than God have become primary. And quite frankly, there's nothing short of idolatry. And so because we can become too lukewarm, too uncommitted, too much torn between things of God and things of this earth, like wealth or pleasure or power or fame, we've turned our temples into marketplaces. Now, if that's you, and don't kid yourself, that's most of us, it's time for a cleansing. And the same Lord Jesus Christ with the same force and power that he used to drive out all that mess back in Jerusalem all those years ago will drive out all that you don't need anymore if you simply give him permission to do so. And that perhaps is the most remarkable thing about all this. All that power to cleanse, to heal, to put our lives back into order is not going to be forced upon us. We have to want it. But if you can say to our Lord Jesus, here at this Mass, Lord, my life has become, yeah, somewhat of a mess. Please, use your healing power and cleanse me. You know what? He will. He will. And then you will come to find something quite remarkable. You'll discover something that's just truly wonderful, most comforting. You'll come to see that Jesus has already said to you, zeal for your house, your temple, will consume me. He's already said that. And when he said that to you, he said that as he hung upon the cross, dying for perfect love of you.